it's my uh, privilege to welcome you this evening. This is a very significant, significant day. We remember something that really, for all of us who know Jesus Christ, has changed our lives forever. And indeed, it has brought us eternal hope. But, you know, it's so easy, I think, for us to immediately go to Easter. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is when we rest and we settle on this day, it really does bring so much meaning and answers to our present circumstances. So in that heart, as we prepare in this time of worship, would you please stand with me and join me? We'll be singing out the blue hymnal, number 178, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. This is a prayer that is recorded for us. It is for the purpose of Good Friday. It is written by Walter Brueggemann. 
You are welcome, since it is a prayer, to close your eyes and bow your head with whatever is meaning to you, but I pray that you would hear closely these words and meditate on them. Would you join me? Holy God, who hovers daily round us in fidelity and compassion, this day we are mindful of another dread-filled hovering, that of the power of death before which we stand thin and needful. All our days, we are mindful of the pieces of our lives and the parts of your world that are on the loose and destructive ways. We notice that wildness midst our fear and our anger unresolved. We mark it in a world of brutality and poverty and hunger all around us. We notice all our days. But on this day of all days, that great threat looms so large so powerful. It is not for nothing that we tremble at these three hours of darkness and the raging earthquake. It is not for nothing that we have a sense of our helplessness before the dread power of death that has broken loose and that struts against our interest and even against our will. Our whole life is not unlike the playground in the village, lovely and delightful and filled with squeals unafraid. And then we remember the silencing of all those squeals and death. And we remember the legions of names that are swept away in a riddle too deep for knowing. Our whole life is like that playground. And on this dread-filled Friday, we pause before the terrible silencing that we cannot master. And so we come in our helpless candor this day, remembering, giving thanks, celebrating, but not for one instant unmindful of dangers too ominous and powers too sturdy and threats well beyond us. We turn eventually from our hurt of children lost. We turn finally from all our unresolved losses to the cosmic grief at the loss of Jesus. We recall and relive that wrenching Friday when the hurt cut to our heart. We see in that terrible hurt our own losses and your full embrace of loss and defeat. We dare pray while the darkness descends and the earthquake trembles. We dare pray for eyes to see fully and mouths to speak fully the power of death all around. We dare pray for a capacity to notice unflinching that in our happy playgrounds, other children die and grow silent. We pray more for your notice and your promise and your healing. Our only urging on Friday is that you live this as we must, impacted but not destroyed, dimmed but not quenched. For your great staying power and your promise of newness, we praise you. It is in your power and your promise that we take our stand this day. We dare trust that Friday is never the last day, so we watch for the new day of life. Oh, hear our prayer and be your full self toward us. Amen. I believe there's some special music now.
Good. Well, we're going to send the kids down for the next uh, section here. So kids, come on up. We're going to send you down. Thanks to Pastor Peter and Gabe for going down with the kids. Uh, teach them. Let's pray for them. Lord, we thank you for these children and they're dear to us. They're even dearer to you, Lord. And we ask your blessing upon each one, uh, Lord, that they would know that wondrous love that was just played, Lord, uh, in their souls, that they may use their Savior and Lord and uh, walk in holiness all their days, that they might be blessed and be a blessing until they arrive in your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before we get started, did everyone get a communion cup? Because we're going to celebrate communion. Anybody not get one? All right, good. Well, let me begin with a word of prayer, and then let me read some familiar words from the prophet Isaiah. Let's pray. Lord, this truly is Good Friday. Lord, it was not good for you in, in many ways, but it was good for us. Uh, Lord, because of your suffering, uh, it became the best Friday ever. We thank you for that, Lord, and we pray for your blessing during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all wandered from God's righteous paths. We've all known what the right thing was to do, and we've chosen otherwise. All of us know there are words we shouldn't speak, and we've chosen to speak them anyway. We've entertained evil thoughts in our hearts, even when we knew such guests were displeasing to God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We've, we've known what the good ways are because the good shepherd himself has told us these are the ways, walk in them. But we all, like stubborn sheep, have refused to walk in those ways. Instead, we've returned aside to our own paths where we've placed ourselves in ultimate and eternal peril. It's a foolish sheep which has strayed from the path which should suffer the fate of the wolves. But it's the good shepherd who gave himself up to the wolves so they would be satisfied and let us go free, untouched. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We deserve to die, but it's Christ who died instead to save us. As one author has written, Why, O oh why, do you stoop, O oh thou eternal Son of the Father? Why do you abase yourself from me? I have sinned, and thou art punished. I have exalted myself and you are dejected. I have smitten thee, and thou art smitten for me. I have dishonored thee, and thou for my sake art scorned. My hands have been quick to do wickedness, and your hands have been pierced with nails. 
My lips said, we will not have this man rule over us. And your lips said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. My face was set like flint against you. Yet you set your face like flint for Jerusalem for me. My feet were quick to shed blood, and yet you shed your blood for me. One day my head will wear a crown of gold, because your head has worn the crown of thorns. We deserve to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Behold God's humility. He's the one who's been wrong time and time and time again. But he's also the one who seeks reconcili reconciliation and initiates it, not us. We should be pleading with him for forgiveness and reconciliation, but he's the one who pleads with us. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That is what makes Friday, Good Friday so good. God wants to be reconciled with us despite all these terrible things we've done against him. He actually pleads with us through his ambassadors, be reconciled to God. What kind of king is it who pleads with his subjects who have rebelled against him and tried to overthrow his reign time and time again? To come and be reconciled, to come in and all will be forgiven. It will be just as it was before. This is amazing love. But God demonstrates his own love for us. And as while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. No one was more aware of that truth than the apostle Paul who wrote these words. Paul was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man who persecuted this way of Christianity to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. No one ever opposed God's will or lived more under a rebel flag than Saul, the Apostle Paul. He hunted down God's loyal subjects with joyous zeal. But that's one of the primary reasons that God had mercy on him. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. One of the reasons the Lord saved the Apostle Paul, one of the worst of sinners, is so that we could have confidence that God would forgive and save us too, no matter how great our sins might be. If he could save Paul, the great persecutor of the faith, then surely his grace can reach as far as you and me. He can save anyone. Stephen Charnock put it this way back in the 1600s. God set up the Apostle Paul as a white flag to invite all rebels to come and make a peace treaty with him and return to their loyal service. Just as every public scourging of a man in chains is meant to deter others from the practice, so every act of God's mercy leading to a public conversion is a message to the spectators that they can find mercy from God also. God saved the Apostle Paul in part as a sign to all of us. It was a, a white flag of truth to signify that anyone and everyone could come in and submit themselves to the king anew and make peace with him and be fully forgiven, all their infractions gone. If God can forgive the chief of rebels, the Apostle Paul, if he can offer him a white flag of truce, then how much more can he have mercy on you and me and do the same? He will forgive all your sin and rebellion also if you'll come and submit your life to him and ask him for it. 
Jesus came to earth for just that purpose. He was literally born to die so that we might live and never die. The poet George Herbert once wrote, he was speaking from Jesus' perspective from the cross. O oh, all ye who pass by, behold and see, man stole the fruit, but I must climb the tree, the tree of life to all, but only me. We all sinned, we all stole the fruit, but he had to climb the tree of the cross to pay for it, to pay for that stolen fruit, our sins. As a result, that tree became a tree of life to all of us, except for him who climbed it to pay for our sins. Such was the love Jesus had for us that he came to live and to die for that sole reason, so that we would not have to die eternally. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. To him be the praise and the glory and the honor forever and ever and ever. Amen. We'll take a moment in silence. Just bow your head and close your eyes. and Just thank God in your heart for that full forgiveness that he's provided for us on this day. Take a moment to do that and then I'll, I'll cue you. And if anybody would like to just openly speak and praise God and thank him, we'll do that. Take a moment in silence. If anyone would like to pray out loud and give thanks to God, feel free to do that. Lord God, there is no God like you who dwells in heaven or earth. Keep your promises and show unfailing love. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your sacrificial love. Mm -hmm. No, no greater love than you. You lay lay down and die for us. Mm -hmm. You lay down for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Lord, as the hymn writer says, what language can we borrow? Lord, we need to invent new language to describe what you've done for us and to express the kind of thanks that we need to express. Uh, our, our language won't suffice. We need to borrow from another. So, Lord, we do give you all the praise and honor and glory. We recognize our sin. We recognize we fall short, uh, that we could not have... Uh, one heaven on our own. So, Lord, you came down and brought it to us by your grace. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. You want to get your cup ready there? If you're a believer in Jesus, we invite you to partake of this. This is an expression of faith. So uh, if you do not currently believe in Jesus, uh, we just ask you not to participate and come see me afterwards. And we can, if you'd like, and we can talk about what it, that involves to put your faith in Jesus. So.
Let me re uh, read from 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse uh, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jim, would you give thanks for the bread, please? his broken body which like bread gives us life let's take and eat in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, Mike, would you give thanks for the cup, please? Lord Jesus, you fulfilled the old covenant and the print on tablets of stone and established the new covenant that Jeremiah promised that your law is written on our hearts, taking our hearts of stone and becoming the heart of blood. Hmm. That new covenant was established in your blood, not the blood of men and goats. Hmm. We give you the praise and the thanks. We celebrate your Well, our life's blood was demanded for our sins, and Jesus poured out his blood in the altar in heaven uh, to take the place. The life of the flesh is in, in the blood I've given upon the altar to make atonement for your soul. So let's take and drink together. We have a closing hymn, uh, 104 in the Red Hymnal, Jesus Paid It All. Let's stand as we sing this together, 104 in the Red Hymnal. Yeah. 
story a number of years ago, I believe it was a true story about a little boy. He had a sister who was about the same age, and she was very sick. She needed a blood transfusion, and his blood matched, so they hooked him up for a blood transfusion and, uh, so that he could help her. And in the middle of it, he turned to the doctor, the little boy, and said, when do I die? Now, he didn't understand what was going on, but he was willing to give his life for his sister. <laughs> Jesus did that for us. He actually did that. Go in peace and praise his name. Amen.